minutes, I'm going to try to present to you basically how um, AI is revolutionizing the, 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 the telecom industry in terms of applications. So my name is Merwan Debao. I'm at the moment director of the Mathematical and Algorithmic Sciences Lab of Huawei, which is based in uh, Paris with around 80 people. But we have also a small team in Moscow, also mathematicians working on the topics of mathematics in general. AI is a part of that. Uh, we'll have maybe discussion afterwards to give you more ideas about what we're doing. Okay, so let's go back a bit about, about the roots. As you know, uh, AI is, uh, a lot of people put it back to computer science field. You have to know that also the information theory field, and especially in telecommunication, it dates back, at least for us, to a paper of uh, Shannon, which was published in 1949, which gives you basically uh, the, 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 the date with respect to those uh, landmark papers related to also 1948 of game theory and also of information theory of Andelman and also Shannon. And basically in that paper, which is quite surprising, Shannon was trying to devise the way that the communication industry could be revolutionized by machines which could perform different tasks. And I strongly encourage you to do that. Of course, it starts with playing chess. As you know, Shannon was a big uh, a fan of, of chess, chess and other games. But it turns out in that paper, what's quite surprising is that he devises basically the ideas of building machines. And this is taken from his paper where basically he tries to talk about machines for designing filters and equalizers. As you know, the majority of work that we're doing at the moment is trying to model how channel are, how things are, and then we get engineers who build those things. It turns out that one of his key ideas was basically is it possible to have an intelligent entity which basically trusts in software to build the equalizer adaptively to the different environment and also equalizer. I'll talk about that. Those ideas came up a couple of years ago to a concept called software defined radio and connected radio, but we didn't have the processing power, the algorithms to do it, and now it's coming back again. Same thing for designing relays and switching circuits, which is one of the big things in our industry. Machines also to handle routing of telephone calls, how you do routing also in our networks, which is a very difficult thing because basically we know some patterns of people and how information flows. And as you know, every Wednesday you take a different route from Tuesday and Monday, so you can adapt that to the telecom industry in how information is routed on Monday, Tuesday, or depending on the given circumstances. Same thing for symbolic operation, translating one language from the other, I think you're all familiar with that. And also making strategic decisions and simplifying, simplifying military operations capable of orchestrating melody, and also, which is the big step that we're going towards, logical deduction, if we can make it, basically. So I strongly encourage you to read that, and basically the idea, I would say, of deep learning is inside, but the idea of layers, of how deep in the layer of thinking you can do, and how many when you play chess, backwards, in terms of thinking you can go, and how many moves you can store in your head to make it happen. And at that time, in the same paper, Shannon, of course, sets back the rules of how you can do it, and also sets back also the, the fact that it takes too much time to do it. Okay, we don't have enough processing power, we don't have enough storage memory to go back in those kinds of deep layers. And if you see that, it compares a human player with some kind of machines and look at how many moves deep you can go in the process, going from 15 to 20 moves deep compared to other systems. So what I mean by that is that uh, the idea, the concept of AI applied to telecommunication is not something new. Of course, it took us time to see how we could go forward in doing that. You have to know that, of course, um, in the 90s, some people got back into those ideas and developed the concept of what we call software-defined radio and up to the concept of cognitive radio. So what is the concept of this software-defined radio? People realized that you could reconfigure the whole phone through software. And people push the idea that when you look at a phone, it's an alphabet. What's the alphabet of a phone? Is a transistor, a conductance, and a resistance, and a half dies, of course, transistors. Okay, that makes exactly an alphabet. And now if you give the software, which internet interconnects all these elements, then you can build any kind of radio you want. There's nothing about 5G, 4G, 3G. You just need to upload the software, which reconfigures your phone to the new technology you want. So of course, it, it seems like heaven, and that's what people were trying to push, because basically you could do that. The second thing is how to do that intelligently, because of course you can go on an app of what we call technologies, not an app of services, and you go in the app store, and basically you download Bluetooth, and your phone becomes a Bluetooth device. You download 
whatever you want to technology, you, your, your, your smartphone can step. So that's already a good step to do. You have to know that in the military domain, we do already that. We have the ways to reconfigure some, some hardware, basically by flashing with software, basically how to interconnect the device. You know, processing, you can put it on the phone, but it's something we're going to But then, if you can think of a connective radio, meaning a radio by itself, which does automatically starts to find what is the best technology to communicate on an instant. What are, how to change the parameters, because at one moment, you took the device into the space, and then you came back to Earth. You went underwater acoustics. Whatever medium you change automatically, it finds a way to design the best protocol of communication, some kind of self-adaptation. It turns out that those ideas came back at the end of 2000, uh, and then 2005, but then we get stalled into the problem of complexity. A lot of complexity issues, a lot of power consumption issues, and it was hard to get, except in some specific case. No AI, but just software, uh, I would say, uh, flash. Now, of course, uh, it got back, and in the years, the last two years, we've been seeing an industry a lot of move towards that. Now, we're not seeing the cognitive radio sense, but still the fact that you could start putting more and more processing power in the different places. This is called mobile AI. So what is mobile AI that the industry is pushing at the moment is the fact that you can do it the same what we call on-device AI and the cloud AI. That's the combination. As you know, um, at the moment, there's a ways of how to configure AI at the same time by putting it on the device, we have many scenarios where latency is an issue, we have many issues where connectivity is an issue, and how you split this complexity or intelligence between a mobile device and basically the cloud where basically you can do much more. Of course, all the ideas of federated learning, distributed learning, whatever you can think of are there, where you download the model, and in a couple of minutes, hours, days, you start working with that model and you go in. It's still not on the telecommunication part, it's mostly, of course, on this image processing part, it's still, of course, on this voice recognition part. But now we're trying to see how, and I'll talk about that, a phone could be able to change its parameters, the network could be self-organized. This is called SUB, the concept of self-organized network. Okay, now, of course, why now, and not before, when I show you all the ideas, it's the combination of these three points that everybody is aware of. The first one is, of course, the algorithmic aspects. Basically, we're starting to have better and better algorithms. Deep learning is one, but more and more sophisticated algorithms. The second, of course, is the processing power, the computing capacity that you can build in in those devices and also the network, and how you can leverage the whole intelligence and the whole processing power to compute intelligence. And the third part, of course, is basically the data, which is now getting available, where we have huge possibilities now to learn on different databases. The last point is a bit of an issue for our community, the telecommunication community. You have to know that we've, we've been, and I've been also one of the guys inside, not to open. And one of the reasons is, as you know, we have many problems where we take care of our clients, and we are still skeptical compared to other industries of opening our data. And as you know, the best way to progress very fast is to open your data. On the first two points, I think, we're making a lot of progress, basically, at the algorithmic level. We have now more and more sophisticated algorithms running in our network. Second is, of course, the computing power, computing capacity. I think our industry is the one leading that thing in general. The third one is so-so. We still have a hard time when uh, academics come to us and say, okay, we want to play with your data. We're a bit fearful about how to process and how to make this happen. Okay. Now, let's see about our industry. What is our industry about? Well, basically, you have to know that whenever you have something called a base station, an antenna, as you can see here on the left, it's something that transmits in a medium which is quite, I would say, uh, random. It turns out that in our network at the moment, when we start operating a network in general, we have a lot of data. We have three types of data. The first type of data is what we call the network data. So what is the network data? Well, basically, it's all the signaling that you have. Okay, basically, we know when a handover happened, meaning a guy is moving from one antenna to the other. We don't know who it is, but we know that there's a lot of signal being triggered at that point there. We know exactly when traffic is getting more and more happening. We know basically when people are synchronizing on the network, when basically you synchronize your app. All these information we have, it. we don't have specifically what kind of app, 
but basically all that signaling enables you still to conduct better and better proactive schemes. Second thing that we have is user data. There, there's two set of people. There's the operators, which own the data. They have user data. And then you have basically the manufacturers of network, where basically we all own the data. In general, we can only rely basically on the information that the operator gave us. And then all the services also which are given to the users, where basically this is also an astronomical data, which basically is third parties on whom we work, which provide those services, and for which we can, of course, of leverage that data in a smart manner to be able to boost our network. Now, what's the first thing that uh, happens at the moment? First big problem that we have in which AI started to be the solution is what we call OPEX. OPEX means basically the operational expenses, where basically when we deploy our network, it's extremely complicated to configure all the elements. When you put a base station somewhere, well, basically, it doesn't necessarily increase the capacity of your network. When you put a small cell, a Wi-Fi box, it doesn't increase your capacity. Why? Because if you configure it badly, it increases the interference, basically, on your network. So you need to tune those parameters. In our business, we have what we call radio network engineers, which is called radio planning, which go on the field, spend time with a truck, measuring, asking to change the position of the antenna, to do a bit of tilting, changing the different parameters. This takes a lot of time, a lot of money. Where to position the different things is also a big thing. Where should I position my base station? How to understand the impact of something? Of course, the same thing here, when you start evolving your technology, is the same thing. Whenever you make a change in terms of evolution, it doesn't increase necessarily your performance. You need also to tune all the parameters around. This is a big challenge that we have in our network on how to do it. Second, of course, is the number of parameters has exploded in our network. You have to know that whenever we start changing something, it has a huge impact on the other. We, as I would say telecommunication engineers, were very good in modeling, meaning we could have very good end-to-end -end models, but it turns out that as time goes by, 5G, getting connectivity, getting video, quality of experience, not quality of service, something we cannot define exactly. How can you define a quality of experience because it's subjective? All these parameters got into a problem where we need this black box approach because we're not able anymore to understand fully how to write mathematically the model of the impact of the user on this cell to the other on your user cell. I'll give you an example. You're in a cell, you start moving. If you start moving, then the base station will increase the resources it will give you not to lose the connection because you're getting farther. But if I increase the resources I give you, I have an impact on the other user. The other user is getting less, basically, because I cannot give you more. So a change on one guy is having an impact on all the other guys. We used to be able to model this very nicely, but at a network level, we're not able anymore because the base station is connected to an IP network. There is uh, fiber, all this, how you can latency issues. We can only rely on all the experiences, data we have to understand how we can tune the parameters and, of course, how the machine can do it on its own. So let me give you a couple of examples that uh, we are already working on. This is called basically automatic deployment, where there are three aspects. One is what we call the self-detection. Basically, whenever you put a new hardware, it detects what's the other hardware around. It detects also the topology. We have a system basically, when we put a box Wi-Fi, it can detect the topology and know what are the nearest neighbors around based on based signaling it, it, it sees. And also basically whenever there is a problem on the box, this is something also uh, we can do and it's called self-detection. Second point is self-configuration. How to change all the tune parameters. And the third one which uh, operators like the most is called self-planning. Meaning basically you put your network and automatically the frequency on which your box is gonna transmit is defined. The frequency planning is defined the power allocation of your different boxes, how to reduce everything is done in a different manner. These self-detection, self-configuration, self-planning are called in our business self-X, meaning self whatever you want with the idea of doing self-organized network which can tune their parameters totally in a very fast manner. Second is of course how you optimize unexpected events. Basically, at one moment, there's a huge number of people at one spot and you need to rechange all the configuration to support the capacity of that. 
Of course, typical examples are every year we know that on the Champs-Élysées we get so many people and this is the configuration that happens. But of course we have a lot of experience coming from different places in the world, going from Kenya to the US to whatever, where when a surge happened, a lot of people happen and there's a requirement of getting the capacity because of demonstration, we can leverage that and tune adaptively how to rechange all the parameters to support that unexpected number of people coming in because there's a rush, there's a football game. All these events are very dramatic for us because this is where the consumption is. If I take, for example, a football game in the US, meaning uh, football not in the soccer sense, you can imagine the number of people streaming the video at one moment and getting all the display of things, and this is a big market for us that we cannot lose when we start. The third one is, of course, also how to deploy these narrow band IoT devices. When you start deploy deploying IoT devices, you have a lot of constraints. The constraints are in terms of energy. If you deploy them in a very ma bad manner, then the transmission requires a lot of power to achieve that quality of service. You have also how you deploy the transmission of success to reduce the failures, because if two devices are transmitting at the same time. So the policy on with which the different devices are transmitting, this is also something where we have patterns thanks to our data that we can exploit at the moment to be able to have a better deployment of our different sensors to leverage the energy consumption away. Of course, a lot of techniques you can imagine whenever you're in a closed loop rely on algorithms that you, I think you quite know, which are based on reinforcement learning. Because basically at the moment you start having these, uh, I would say, uh, uh, loops inside, then of course you can leverage basically from some kind of utility and some kind of regret uh, function that you do and then you start learning at the same time. I'll give you an example, for example, for doing tilting of antennas. You know, in, in a, now our base stations tilt. What it means, it means that you have your antenna that can move like this to like this, basically. So it's not done in a digital manner. It's done, sorry, in a digital manner, not a mechanical manner, meaning that we can beam our beams in a 3D manner according where the traffic is. So typically, I give you an example. We know that in cities, there's nobody on the skyscraper during the night. We're not going to put our antennas tilting over there. We're going to put them on roads at 8 o'clock and then tilting towards houses. And then during the day, that's where people are. The antenna is going to tilt because people are on the skyscraper. So your basic system needs adaptively each time to change its configuration according to where the population is at one moment of the instance. In general, this scheme exists. We do it on a two-day basis. I mean, two, uh, two 12 hours basis, meaning in the morning and the night. It's very hard to make this function very fast. In general, it's day, night. Day, night, these patterns that we exploit. We're not able to exploit patterns which are extremely fast uh, uh, going for that. But you could think of very good examples. This is already something that we're pushing at the moment of learning that the fact that you are under a tunnel and then we pre-buffer basically the video in your mobile before you go under the tunnel to avoid the fact that you don't have any quality of service during when the time you're going on the tunnel. These are examples uh, uh, things. Of course, the KPI anomaly detection, where basically uh, we start trying to design better tuning of the parameter to know, basically not on a fixed part, as you can see on the left there, you have basically a fixed threshold in general, and then you start leveraging whenever there's something happening. And of course, what we do now is more adaptive where the threshold can be refined in a very clever manner depending on the circumstances. And these are things which are already running in our network to be able to better uh, detect whenever there's a change. There's also what we call lo uh, localization accuracy improvements. You have to know that we are also able now to know when you are in a car, when you're outside a car. We don't know exactly who you are, but we know that you're going in a car thanks to the signal or the RF signal, that you get into a building, you're out of the building, you're located somewhere, basically on the traces we have. These are techniques related to something pa uh, over the past called fingerprinting, but here we do it more on the radio. Fingerprinting means basically the signature of your signal, RF signal, enables basically to, to know where you're localized. Of course, we use then all the patterns that we have to be able to refine basically where the user can be localized. Of course, localization is one of the big businesses for us, you have to know, because based on localization, as you know, you can build up a lot of services. For our pro issues, it's more about better quality of service, because if we know basically in which environment we are, we can put you on another network. We can basically change the parameters of transmission, such as we can build up 
basically the signal towards uh, your case. And I'll finish with this example. I know I'm running out of time. I'll finish with this example, which is also very interesting, is what we call multi-user MIMO pattern optimization, which is also something that we're doing. You have to know that at the moment, basically, one of the key technologies that we're building is called beamforming. I don't know if some of you heard about it in telecommunication. What is beamforming is that until now, many of network network, when they were transmitting the information, they were transmitting the information in what we call an omnidirectional manner. Basically, the signal goes over everywhere because we don't know where you are. Okay, basically, we don't know. Now, to improve the rate, one of the key technologies called beamforming, we're able to create a wired link in a wireless link, where basically the antenna, thanks to technology called MIMO, beams exactly towards the destination. So you're not interfering on other people. I can exactly point towards you. Okay? And basically, by doing that, of course, I reduce the effect of uh, interference. I also am able to converge exactly the energy towards your device, and I can increase your quality of service and quality of rate. So for doing this, of course, you need a lot of information. And this is very difficult because basically, usually you're behind a wall. So even if I know basically that I get a signal and I do some kind of triangulation, it's not enough because you may be behind a wall, the signal bounces back, comes here. So of course, we're using all this uh, training to have a better location, to update the initial beam, do the modeling, evaluation, and then every time we can refine and do some beam pattern. The second thing is that we don't necessarily need to recalculate every time the beam because this is done in a digital manner. We have already a code book of beams which are due to all the beams that we gave. We know that at five o'clock, basically, on that scenario, we have to beam there because every time, every day at five o'clock, this is where the information is getting. So basically, we have the code book to beam on that thing. And then at 5.10, we know what to do at 5.25. And then we learn progressively by doing these techniques. So this is also one of the key technologies which is being pushed in 5G to blast the rate by having more localized transmissions towards my destination to this technology of beamforming. I think I'll stop here and give you a couple of flavor of, of information. I'll just finish with this important information. You have to know that our industry is also taking AI into standardization, okay? Which is something quite new, because you can ask yourself, why are you gonna standardize? So HC there is what we call the European Telecommunication uh, Standard Institute, which is located in Sofia Otipolis. Since February 2017, there's a task group working on building some kind of possibility to have access on some of the point of the network to data, not user data, but at least signaling data, to be able to capture it and run algorithms, AI algorithms, to improve the network. So this is very important to know what are the different parameters we're gonna standardize to be able to capture them so that our network works. And here I just gave you the evolution which is on our industry being done, where basically we wanna go from what we call a self-decision making using event conditional action policy to something in the declarative midterm which is self-decision making with declarative policy statements. And this is what we're targeting at the moment where we have what we call a self-learning AI telecommunication network, self-decision making based on intelligence generated by self-learning AI algorithms. So this is the three different steps that we're tackling at the moment and basically which is gonna be something that is gonna be standardized for our network. So not the algorithm, but how you access the different, I would say, links so that you can run your algorithms uh, in our network. I'll finish by that. Okay. Thank you very much, Merwan. Please. Uh, you can keep. I'll keep here. Yeah, join me here. Okay, just, uh, we have a few questions, but I'm going to start with one, one specific question from your presentation. Looks like the main challenge is more regarding how to treat uh, all this large volume of data with different type of data. So that's where you are now in the, in the stage of industry, more than trying to find predictive models or developing the models. Can you tell us exactly where you stand with these different stages? Well, well both. First of all, you have to know that uh, basically, uh, uh, so there are what I call the algorithmic part, uh, where it's still, still work is gonna be done. We don't have necessarily structured data. It sounds uh, crazy, but our data someone sometimes is missing, sometimes is wrong. Why? Because we have a lot of errors in our network. And when you have a feedback, basically, or an ACNAC, you generate some data, but the data is wrong, okay? So that's basically a lot of data that you have, sometimes is either wrong or missing, 
And basically, you need to capture with robust algorithms which are able to do that. Second, you have to know that even though we get a lot of, of data, uh, many, many, even us work with subcontractors. Okay, well, that's how our networks are done, meaning we don't have necessarily people working in, in I, I don't know, in Algeria or other ways, we have some contractors. These subcontractors, when they build the, the big data sheets, they're not aware that what they're putting on the data sheet is very important for us. So they just do it randomly. They just put like I did a 9.5 and then I did something and then It turns out that very often that data is either wrong badly written and we need to understand basically how to use it. So we train our network sometimes with very wrong data and we need to find algorithms which are quite sophisticated. That's the first thing. Second thing maybe also important, I talked mostly here because I think you were fed up with the phone, but you have to know that Huawei does at the same time the care business, but also the smartphone. We control nearly the whole chain, meaning going from the smartphone. I don't want to talk too much about the phone because I think you have so many talks about uh, and about the phones. You have to know that, that on that part, also the fact that how you do on-device AI is an issue for us, okay? Why? Because basically we are now considering how to split the intelligence. This is what I call the collective intelligence and the individual intelligence on a network taking into account all the constraints we have. The, con the major constraint is latency. A car, typically, is a smartphone for us. Of course, it's a moving smartphone, but in a couple of years, it's gonna be a full smartphone. And basically, you cannot rely on computing getting back. You don't have connectivity always. Can you just give an, uh, a quick example for everyone one on the latency, for example, for the autonomous vehicle, for example? What would be the impact of the latency there? So, the, the typical example that people give here is that in the future, if you want a car which rides at 100 kilometer an hour. That's basically, okay? At the moment on a 4G network where the latency is around 50 milliseconds, it can go up to 40 milliseconds, and in general, it's not guaranteed. We cannot guarantee the, the latency. We can give you an average number. When you break, the signal goes back. It comes back, you're around three meters before it stops. On a 5G network, this is what we're trying to build, is a latency of one millisecond, where basically at the moment, the information goes back and comes back with the computing, whatever you want you go around two centimeters. So the latency requirements are around one millisecond. So in one millisecond, it's quite difficult. You need to have something <laughs> on, uh, on the device. So whatever <laughs> device it is, it can be, of course, a drone, it can be something else. And you have to know that, of course, cars are going faster and faster because of all these uh, productivity issues, let's say this way. Uh, and this is an issue for us. So, and connectivity also, because uh, at one moment, if, if your device is not connected, it cannot be dumb. It has to continue to be smart. So typically, if you are on an airplane during those eight hours plane, you need to have an AI-enabled phone. But this is, I think, not the most crucial aspect. But of course, for our car, it's even worse. But that means, just coming back to that point, because it's quite interesting on the autonomous vehicle, that means for you, it's definitely a subject where Huawei has to provide some solutions. Uh, or do you think it's more the Google guys or the guys that, that are going to work on, on this kind of algorithm or it's really part of your job also to, to, to yeah, provide so solutions? So it's not just Huawei, let's say it's the whole telecom industry in terms of manufacturers going from Nokia, Ericsson and us, yes, to provide the pipes necessary to connect. So these pipes, of course, can be through the network or through what we call also device-to-device -device connection, meaning in, our, uh, in the automobile industry, it's called V2V, vehicular to V2V, and how you combine both, yeah. Okay, yeah, question over there. Thank you very much. So you actually just touched on the point which I wanted to ask you about, which was V2V versus 5G. And I was wondering if you work on, on um, communication between self-driving cars and what you think the merits of a, a 5G system versus the US system, which is V2V, and if you're doing any partnerships with car manufacturers. Okay, so that's a good question. So. Uh, personally not, Huawei yes. We have a whole division of people working for the car industry, which is called a vertical for us, of course, uh, in our center in Munich. You have to know that the ecosystem of uh, German, the German ecosystem in terms of, uh, in French it's called Industrie du Futur, but uh, Industry 4.0, is quite, is quite mature and we have been working since a couple of years uh, devising some, some connectivity solutions for the self-driving car autonomous car in this. Now, your question is a, very good, is a very good question in terms of, is it gonna be 5G, is it gonna be V2V, and how you split both? At the moment, 5G is being considered as a key technology for that, but it turns out that coverage, 
is an issue. What it means coverage, as you know already now in 4G, <laughs> all France is not covered. So basically the, the question is how you can mix both. And at the moment it's more on the mixing of both because basically 5G, if it stands to what it has promised, meaning in 2020, 20, delivering 10 gigabit per second, why not? One million object connected per kilometer square and one millisecond latency, then of course it's gonna be one of the options which is gonna be used for being able to, 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 to talk to the car, connect to the car, and do all those real-time stuff, yeah. Okay, any other question from the audience? The last, yeah, there is one here. Yeah, you mentioned software-defined radio. That's an uh, uh, old subject. And uh, I, I remember there was a European military program which lasted for 20 years, and that was an un unmitigated, uh, you know, uh, not disaster, but that was a, a huge endeavor. So uh, that highlights the point of uh, uh, w w technology is hard, uh, uh, independently of algorithm. And uh, so I wanted to ask you, how much uh, of those new ideas um, are really relying or on, on advanced, you know, day-to-day -day technology, or um, and how much relies on new algorithm, new ideas? Uh, of course, deep neural network it comes, you know, to mind, etc. But you know, how much uh, of a um, uh, impedance is just technology? Yeah. So good question. Also, so maybe all the audience is not familiar, but you have to know that the concept of software-defined radio was in the 90s one of the revolutionary concepts in communication because people thought that everything could be software. You know, you, you don't need, you don't need hardware anymore. As I told you, you have an alphabet. You give the software which interconnects the alphabet, and you don't need even 5G. So of course, this did not come true. It doesn't mean that we're not still going the words. Same thing, military was, DARPA has started. We had military European project who devised something, but we not, cannot really configure on a smartphone things. We can do it on huge things, okay? What happens, however, we can do what we call software upgrading over networks. We can do SDN, software defined networking, network function virtualization. These are things which are being done and which are being considered as technologies on which we can change some parameters, but not fully to the granularity of uh, these alphabets. We can, we just took the granularity at a higher level. So not at the alphabet, but you could say at the word level and you change words, it's, 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 it's okay. Okay, so this is something which is already going on at the moment. And FVSDN is also being pushed quite hard at the moment for that. But I have to admit that the software defined radio is not gonna be in 5G. It's gonna be after. It's not even being discussed at the moment in 5G, so for information. So it's gonna be after. Because we still have a hard time making consumption, uh, uh, real-time things, but this is a, a, a trend in any case which is there. So it's gonna happen, we don't know when. Yeah. Okay, Merwan, thanks a lot. Uh, we're going to stop there. So if you have more questions, you can go and see Merwan after, uh, after the event. Thanks a lot, thank you.